and and I think there's such a disrespect or a misunderstanding of the value of the creative industries in this country. Mm. Um, that's why I think the legislators have taken this approach of not listening to advice from people who have been telling them for years, because we've been advocating for this for years. But don't put these things in. But this why world. aren't they listening? I mean, I mean, sorry to say, but like you know, the the creative the creative arts played a massive role in yep. emancipating and, and keeping the spirits of the people alive when it was time for transition into the new, you know, political dispensation, when people were about to go into full-scale war, we use the art. So there's no way people don't see the cultural, you know, importance of what we're doing. I mean, it's it's massive. So why are they ignoring, you know, the the, the, the legal side and, 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 you know, people being compensated what's due to them? So I'll have to start from the beginning. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Welcome to another exciting episode of the Film Biz Show, the only podcast where we delve into industry professionals' minds to get their insight on the current landscape of the film and television business in South Africa and internationally. Please subscribe, like, comment and turn on the notification button so you are aware of our future episodes that you will love so much. Now our next guest has been advocating against the bill a lot of us creatives have been hearing about lately. She is an admitted attorney of the High Court of South Africa and practiced law at one of the leading law firms in South Africa. She was the CEO of Downtown Music Hub, a non-profit company established by the Department of Arts and Culture to deal with some of the challenges of the South African music sector. She's currently the general manager for legal services at the South African music rights organization, SAMRO. She's also currently serving as a chairperson for the Copyright Coalition of South Africa. This organization is currently advocating for copyright legislation that is fit for purpose in a South African context. The coalition is also the South African champion for the Partners Against Piracy Initiative, a multi-territorial initiative that is championing the campaign against piracy of creative content. Here to talk to us about the infamous copyright bill, let's welcome Chola Makamate. Welcome, ma'am. Thank you. Yes, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, look, Chola, you know, you have an extensive, uh, you know, CV, and you've been around in the legal field for quite some time. Mm -hmm. What was it that got you into that space? I've always wanted to be a lawyer. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so we were the generation that watched the Ali McBeals. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Guilty <laughs> <laughs> of the world and yeah. thought law was great and wonderful and fast paced. So I've always wanted to be a lawyer. Mm -hmm. um, and um, my parents obviously approved because they're obviously of the generation where you're a doctor or a lawyer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Only people like my younger siblings could get, get into things like marketing. I didn't yeah. unfortunately have that luxury, but it was something that I really wanted to do. So that's mm. how I got uh, into law. And, and, and as for copyrights, because that's a specialized field and not a lot of black uh, legal practitioners usually choose to go in that direction? So I stumbled into that by mistake. Mm. Uh, I was uh, an employment lawyer, can you believe it? Uh, and I, <laughs> <laughs> tick, tick. <laughs> I then had my daughter yeah. and I took off a year because uh, law firms are not very friendly to, to yeah. <laughs> new moms. Uh, mm. So I took off a year just to spend time with her. Mm. And um, when she was just over a year, I got a call from a friend who said, listen, uh, there's a six month stint mm. uh, that requires some legal expertise. Uh, it's a Department of Arts and Culture, as it was known then, yeah. uh, project. Would you like to uh, get in there and assist? And I said, no, sure, no problem, six months. Um, it sounded simple enough. Mm. It was in an industry that I didn't know much about, which was music. Um, and I got in there. Uh, and effectively, what had happened was that uh, the Department of Arts and Culture had purchased uh, the old Gallo, Gallo Studios that are based in Johannesburg. I don't know if you know the history of Gallo Studios. Please explain, tell us. So yeah. Gallo Recording Studios or Downtown Studios yeah. um, are where a lot of our greats recorded at some point in time. The Lucky Dubes of the world, um, the Yvonne Chaka Chakas of the world. So that, that grouping of, of musicians recorded at Downtown Studios, it used to be buzzing. Okay, I remember, I, I know, I know the, 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 the name of, of the studios, yeah. the Downtown Studios, yeah. but I had no idea that it was purchased by the government. 
it was it was it was purchased by the government through mm. the National Arts Council. And at the time, why they needed me was there were some issues, legal issues around the transfer of the property, employees, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I just came on there as a project manager to deal with some of the handover issues. Seven years later, <laughs> sure. <laughs> as My is the case goodness. with this industry, uh, we managed to renovate the studios. Um, internally, I don't know if you know where they are, uh, based in downtown Joburg, okay. 62 Holt Street, mm. near the, the APSA precinct. Um, so there was a lot of work that we put in there in terms of bringing it up to date with the, the studio facilities uh, that are there. And then um, after seven years, I thought it was time to move on. And then also by mistake, I happened to know uh, some people at Samro and we had had conversations, obviously, because they're in the music rights space and we were a recording studio and, you know, people who were coming to record needed to understand um, the totality of the of the landscape within which they were operating. And there was an opening there for a legal advisor and I interviewed and I got the job and that's how I fell into the copyright space. Oh, that's, that's, that's fantastic. Yeah. So I thought it was um, a specialized field where, you know, you have like an extra module uh, at school to study strictly copyright or as long as you are sort of like an admitted uh, attorney, yeah. you, you can basically get into that space to yeah, as long as you're an admitted attorney. But let me tell you something. The theory of copyright and the practicalities and yeah, how it op yeah. operationalizes, you're not going to learn that yeah. uh, quickly in a law firm. You will have to be in an ground. environment, yeah, like, like a SAMRO um, uh, or, or an organization that deals with copyright yeah. on a day-to-day -day basis. But yes, if you are an admitted attorney and you, you do study copyright as a module, whatever the case, or intellectual property, and uh, copyright is a module, then you can get into that space, but it'll be very theoretical uh, for you. And that's why I think a lot of people struggle with mm. it because you need to understand <laughs> how copyright works. Mm. Now, Chola, we are going to go into a very sensitive issue, mm -hmm. you know, one that's been talked about in the media. A lot of us creatives have no idea what it is yeah because we hear one story next thing we turn we hear a different story um you know actors have been advocated to to uh you know uh vote for for this bill and others are you know so it's a very confusing space in layman's terms please can you tell us what is the copyright amendments bill okay so i'll have to start from the beginning yes ma'am <laughs> with copyright so when you think of intellectual property think of it as a house Here's your roof, right? And usually you have pillars of that house. So you have intellectual property as a, as, as a house. Here's the roof. And then under that house, you have different pillars uh, or rooms, let's say, in that house that have a space for one type or the other of intellectual property. So you can have a room for trademarks. You can have a room for patents. You can have a room for copyright. I think that the why people find trademarks and patents easy to, to deal with is because those are heavily regulated. Mm -hmm. The registration requirements uh, and other requirements are easy to understand and deal with. The paperwork might be uh, voluminous, but it's easy to understand the concepts. Copyright is like you know that neglected cousin that nobody actually understands because it's such a nebulous thing. But essentially, copyright deals with the product of your mind, right? So you think of something. Um, you think of a song. You think of a book idea. You think of something or some sort of creation um, that you want to now have in some sort of material form. So what people must understand first is that you have no copyright in an idea. So you can think of something, but until you put it in material form, so instance, write a song or write a book, there is no copyright, but copyright protects the product of your mind. So that's where we start. So there's no copyright in ideas, but there's copyright in, in what, the, what materializes out of that idea. So for instance, you see guys or, or ladies talking about, no, so-and-so stole my idea, so-and-so stole. No, you can't steal an idea. You, we, the three of us or the four of us can sit in a room and come up with an idea. The person who puts it in material form is the one that owns the copyright mm. in that. So when we talk about something in material form, like I said, you, you write the lyrics of the song down or you write the book, the words to the book down. Then you have what we call a work. Now, in our legislation, there are different types of works. And with those different types of works, depending on certain requirements, they attach copyright. So it must be original. It must be in, in material form. 
Um, and then the, the, the third one, I've just forgot it. Oh, <laughs> oh and it must be a work, sorry. So material, it must be original material form and it must be a work as defined by the act. So I'll stick to uh, songs and books because I think that's the easiest. So you have an idea of a song, you have an idea of a book, um, it's, it's an original um, and then you've made it a material, uh, it's a material form and then it is a work as defined by the Copyright Act. Once those three things happen, there are certain rights that vest to you as the creator of that work. They are intrinsic to you. They, they form a part of you, those rights. And what they call those is a bundle of rights. And that's just a fancy term for saying, for instance, if you have, let me say, four different pens in your hands, right? That we call a bundle of rights. And let's just say for a song, you can have one pen that refers to performance rights. You can have one pen that refers to mechanical rights. You can have another pen for sync rights. You can have another pen for another set of rights. And for each one of those pens, for that one work, you can make money. So each pen represents a revenue stream. So each right represents a revenue stream. Each right can be exploited if you do things properly. Because what tends to happen with a lot of people is that they have this great idea, they write this song, um, and um, you might be co-creators and reduce it to material form together. But then you have the smart one who goes and figures out how to commercialize, and you sign funny contracts, uh, you go to instance for a SAMRO and uh, notify your work, and you don't, you don't notify your friends, you notify yourself, and you're able to exploit. You understand that for each pen, there's money to be made, so you can go to, for instance, like a SAMRO, we, we administer, and I'll get to that, we administer performing rights, so you can make money from that. Um, uh, per per sorry, performance rights, you can make money from that. Capasso administers uh, uh, needle uh, uh, mechanical rights, you can make money from that. If you are uh, a, a creator of the work, the writer of the song, the composer of the song, and you are also the performer of the song, you can make money from needle time rights and get money from Sampra. So people don't understand their role in the creation of the work and how they can then make money from it because that's the genesis of everything. If you understand that you've created the work and you keep the rights. You don't, sign the, you don't sign them off to the highest bid or whatever the case may be. You keep them and you understand the business and the value chain and are able to exploit the rights and the different rights. Then you can make a lot of money. There are some people who are making tons of money from one jingle, mm. right? Nothing complicated, just a jingle. But they understand that for each right and the bundle of rights, they're able to make money. Each represents a revenue stream. So that's, that's copyright. You have this bundle of rights that are intrinsic to you. You own them to you as a person and you're able to exploit them commercially. But you also have on the other side what we call moral rights that vest to you once uh, copyright vests. And that's where, because it's intrinsic to you, if somebody wants to change it um, or distort it, they need to ask for your permission to do so. Now, the rights vest to you, right? They are part of you. They, they, they are you, if I can put it that way, just to be simplistic. You can do what you want. You can exploit those rights, make money from those. Or you can allow others to do certain things with those rights. They can reproduce, they can do certain things, and those things are outlined, obviously, in the legislation. But in order to do so, because they are, they are part of you, they're intrinsic to you as the creator of the work, they must ask for your permission to do so, right? Get a license, and they must pay you a fee. And that's included in the license fee. So. Obviously, a lot of creators don't have the time to be chasing the money. They want to be, you know, writing the books, writing the songs, whatever the case may be. They don't have time for the admin of chasing the money. And that's why you have what we call collecting societies where I work, like a SAMRO. And they're different collecting societies for different rights. Like I said earlier, SAMRO administers, and administers really, it, it, it's, we are the middlemen. We're the middlemen between the, the people who create the work and those who want to use the work. We essentially go out, you, you become, you assign your rights to us, we step into your shoes, we go to users, and a user can be a restaurant, um, it can be a uh, hotel, it can be a streaming platform. They're different, there's a plethora of users who want to use your work. They must, we must now enter into a license agreement, agree on a fee, we then administer all the data that we have as it pertains to what um, the, the user has given us from a usage perspective and what we have in terms of what you have also notified to us. We administer that, there's a calculation in the background, spits out a fee, and then we pay you your royalties. 
that's essentially what we mean when we say we administer copyright. It's very, it's very simple. We're simply the middleman between the user and the creator because the creator needs somebody to deal with the admin. So us lawyers, uh, people who understand Excel spreadsheets, uh, the, we are there in Samro, the Samros <laughs> of the world, to make sure that you, you get your money. But obviously there's an obligation on you as a creator to make sure, firstly, you join a collecting society. Secondly, when you write your song, you notify us. Because what a lot of people do is that they come to a Samro and say, ah, so-and-so is using my music, you're not paying me. Did you notify us? You haven't notified us. And just coming to us once and notifying one work and not notifying the other work doesn't help you because as far as we're concerned, you haven't notified us. So we can't really help you. You know, and understanding things like, also like I said, when you have co-creators of works, when you come and notify us, understand what the splits are. So when you guys are in studio and you're having a great time, then is the time to write the splits. So you understand who is getting 40%, 50%, whatever the case may be. So when you come tell us what the splits are, we can then pay you appropriately. A lot of guys don't do that. Mm. So that's, that's, that's the, the, the copyright part. Now, you can allow others to do, and they must ask you for permission and they must pay you. There are circumstances where that doesn't necessarily have to happen. And that's what's called exceptions to copyright. So it can be for educational purposes, it can be for news, it can be for satire, whatever the case may be. But in our law, we have a closed list of exceptions to copyright. So you have the norm where people must ask you for permission, pay your license fee, and then you have the exceptions to the rule. Those exceptions in our law are called fair dealing. And it's currently a closed list. So let's just say there's about seven items there, but it's a, cl it's a closed list. So everybody knows. So you know you write a song. If somebody wants to use it, they must pay you. They must ask for your permission, except in X circumstances. It's clear, it's black and white. Everybody knows the rules of the game. That's fine. What has happened in the legislative process is that the current drafting of the Copyright Amendment Bill takes the rule, and then they've now brought in this monstrosity they call fair use from the United States, and they've even supercharged it. They've not, they've not even imported it, you know, word for word. They've yeah. supercharged it, yeah. where you have, in the first, in, in our current law, you have a closed list with the fair use exceptions and other exceptions. It's not just fair use. There are other exceptions. You have a broad list of exceptions, and it's not a closed list. It's open-ended. So currently, we know what the rules of the game are, right? It's like a soccer match. We know when there's a penalty, we know when there's offside, the referee, everybody knows the rules of the game with fair dealing. With fair use as it is currently formulated, you never know when it's a penalty, you never know when it's offside, nobody knows what the rules of the game are. And in order to determine whether there's been infringement of copyright, so an infringement would be where somebody is using your work, your work without paying you or asking for permission. In order for you to determine whether there's an infringement, you as the creator, must take the user, and which will be big, big tech in this instance, to court to prove that there's been an sure. infringement of copyright. How are you going to afford that bill exactly. <laughs> as a creative? Exactly. So mm. you must now litigate because, mm. because the list is open-ended. So it's now up to the judge to make a determination as to where, whether there was fair use or whether there's infringement. Now, to make it even worse, a gift from our legislators, is that the U.S. law has punitive damages in its law. So what is that? You, so, for instance, it makes sense to litigate because you get a big payday at the end of the year because it's punitive, right? They're punitive damages. What is that? Um, uh, and what is litigating? It's like, it's like okay, litigating is going to court. Okay, cool. <laughs> so you can go to court. Yeah. It's like simple terms, like they're punishing you for doing something. Sure. You know, they, 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 there's a big mm, <laughs> spanky for, for, for that infringing action. You can get uh, and you can do a class action lawsuit. So you can go, you can take the infringer to court and you can have lawyers who will say, you know what? Um, you, it's, for instance, like the please call me uh, matter. Mm. That thing's been going on for years. Mm. I'm sure those lawyers are waiting for the big payday. <laughs> big, massive. Before they and we paid. are rooting for them. Right? They're waiting for that big payday <laughs> because it makes sense, right? Yeah. With this, no, 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 no. You take someone to court. The most you'll get if you win is what you would have gotten had they paid the license fee to begin with. So let's just say the license fee is 10 rand. Yeah. You spent 20,000 rand litigating or taking somebody to court. Instead of getting millions at the end of it, the most you'll get is the 10 rand you should have gotten in the first place. Sure. So that's, that's, that's just... So, and uh, you know what it's going to do? It's basically going to deflate you as a creative. Correct. Like, what the heck? Yeah. You know what? Just... Yeah. 
it's going to it's going to disincentivize you yeah. and and i think there's such a disrespect or a misunderstanding of the value of the creative industries in this country mm. um that's why i think the legislators have taken this approach of not listening to advice from people who have been telling them for years because we've been advocating for this for years that don't put these things in this But why world. aren't they listening i mean i mean sorry to say but like you know the the creative the creative arts played a massive role in yep. emancipating and and keeping the spirits of the people alive when it was time for transition into the new you know political dispensation when people were about to go into full scale war we used the art so there's no way people don't see the cultural you know importance of what we're doing i mean it's it's massive so why are they ignoring you know the the the, the legal side and, and and you know people being compensated what's due to them number of reasons they don't understand copyright they don't understand how copyright works as it pertains to the creative industries so one thing that they've also done is that they've taken a one size fits all approach to this um uh copyright legislation copyright legislation deals with different works in different sectors i'm focusing on music because obviously music is uh, way way i i that's yeah. my space but they were responding to the cry that musicians were dying poor that's what they trying to fix oh, right they trying to fix that they trying to fix access issues so things like textbooks for students they trying to fix things like that um they trying to fix a whole bunch of things because i mean let's be honest historically speaking creatives have been really exploited quite yeah. badly um they still dying as paupers they are problems in the creative industries so bless them they trying to fix that they just don't understand that you can't have the rules of the game for music applicable to film and television applicable to book publishing applicable to animation it's not going to work what they've done with this thing is like taking the rules of soccer and wanting to apply the, apply them to rugby or tennis or hockey that's effectively what they've done this bill they've taken a one size fits all approach and that's not how the copyright industries work so they don't understand copyright Uh, at the basic level they don't understand how copyright is operationalized in the different sectors within the creative industries they don't understand that and they have been listening to experts who've told them they are going to resolve all of those things that i mentioned so in their minds they're going to resolve all the issues and cmos where i work are going to become more accountable blah 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 there's a whole bunch of things that they've convinced themselves of but what they don't understand for instance let's take the textbooks for argument's sake um you need authors for textbooks right someone writes a book they need to be paid you want to now say they write a book and there are exceptions and there's fair use or whatever the case may be they can write a book we can all photocopy it or give the students for free the author's not going to get paid but don't you think this is why big tech hmm. big tech just google what big tech is <laughs> and you get an understanding of which companies we're talking about <laughs> Don't you think this is this is a way of big tech advocating for AI to infiltrate the creative spaces even more and take away the power from the creatives? Yes, and big tech is a, is, a, is another big conversation on its own. Uh, But basically it's theft of content. Yeah. Um and particularly generative AI where they the, the machine goes and sucks up everybody's ideas or everybody's works that are protected by copyright, sucks it all up doesn't ask for permission doesn't pay anyone and then create something new and then probably have that copyrighted and make money off of that so there's there's a lot of layers to this thing but yes effectively the bottom line is content for free which they will make money off sure. of and then the creatives won't be able to make money off of so if an author can't make money off the book that they've written then that then spills over to publishers in particular local publishers doesn't make business sense for them to Killed operate it. right so you then fine give the textbooks for free it's okay the authors local authors won't get paid uh pu- local publishing uh, uh companies will suffer the bigger ones the international ones will pull out and disinvest um nobody will be incentivized to write books because we'll all just go photocopy your book and then we'll claim fair use and then you must take us to court and um you will kill the industry and there will be the first hit right but it will happen with every other industry a cmo like ours if we try and go remember our job is to go and license users if we go try and license a user and they say ah oh, fair use take me to court that's what we're going to be spending money on taking you to court to prove that you are infringing copyright so that we can pay composers and authors so it's just going to create a lot of confusion there's going to be a lot of litigation 
lawyers will make money. I don't know who else will make money. There will be disinvestment from uh, big book publishing companies. Even in the film and television industry, uh, you'll have disinvestment from your big production companies. You notice that over the last few years, there's been a lot of investment. I won't mention which names. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. From certain companies in into local content, local productions, because you know that support is needed. You can't just rely on the DTIC for funding. You need people who are going to put the money behind a local production. And if you have a country where the laws are so confusing, where it's going to require a litigation to determine the rules of the game, they'll rather go somewhere else. Mm. Um, we've got beautiful scenery. I mean, Cape Town is buzzing sure. from that perspective. People will pull out. Why mm. should you be here if it's just going to be <laughs> hectic to do any work? The returns on investment don't make any sense, and South Africa becomes unattractive from an investment perspective. But, but, but why us? Why are these guys coming to us? I mean, the world's got so many countries... Why don't they go to Scandinavia, Poland, you know, why, why us? Why are they, they coming to us, these guys? Because this, these big tech companies yeah. are multinational companies, yeah. giants. Yes. Why are they coming to us? Because in the EU, they got their asses kicked. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. They yeah. deserve it. <laughs> Take it. <laughs> and, and in the EU, they are far more organized. Yeah. Um, they co cooperate a lot easier mm. in between the countries. And obviously the other issues, traveling is easier, you know, yeah. all of that kind of stuff. So there people are, it's easy to mobilize and fend off. I mean, they're fighting still. It's not like they're having an easy time. It's, it's still difficult. But if they win here and they introduce this legislation here and uh, they are successful, then it's the gateway to the rest of the continent. Gee. And then you'll have African content for free across the board. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. And, you know, I mean, these, these big companies, big tech, I want to keep saying big tech, Google big tech, mm. so you know your enemy. <laughs> but these companies are very good with lobbying, yes. you know. And, you know, we know, you know, I mean, South Africa, you know, we are very politically robust kind of, you know, space. And there's a lot of people that are being bought off, you know, to create lies and to propagate untruths. Allegedly. Allegedly. <laughs> you know, and this could be the case in this. I mean, there's no one with a conscience who will stand in front of a country with 60 million odd people and say, this is safe for you, knowing that it's going to decimate, you know, um, this, this, this business. You know, mm. obviously, then it, it, you know, but uh, this is me mm. alleging that some people <laughs> must be. <laughs> but now, I mean, I want to I want to come to something that, you know, us as actors have been fighting for for quite a while. You know, um, as an actor who's been privileged to work, you know, quite extensively within the ad space. Mm -hmm. um, one huge benefit of doing, you know, adverts who've also taken a, a huge hit, you know, uh, due to COVID. Mm -hmm. And obviously, uh, you know, with more digitization of content, you know, I mean, it's not the same as it used to be. Uh, there's, it's slightly more complex. But one, one thing that one enjoys is the luxury of usage fees from commercials. So I shoot a commercial now. Mm -hmm. or I've shot a commercial five years. And the brand likes it and the audiences respond to it. Mm -hmm. And they can see this ROI on this investment. Uh, every year, there will be a renewal of this, you know, commercial to be on different platforms. And myself, as as the, the artist, I still get compensated. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to long form content, mm -hmm. like an actor who's done a generations, uh, the content might be showing th 20, 30 years later, they still don't get a cent. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the reason why a lot of the creatives and a lot of these you know, some of the big organizations in our space, in my mm. space as an actor, mm. have been advocating for this bill. Mm. But now you're saying we should be careful about, you know, advocating for it from a mere emotive point of view. Because mm. you might find that, yes, one clause might say we'll give you usage fees, but there is other fine print there that is actually more detrimental to us. Would you mind explaining more on that? And this is the tragedy of this legislative process. So you have what we've been having a conversation about, the Copyright Amendment Bill, which deals with um, the creators of works and the users of those works and how you have the balance between the two 
you give the protection and the space to the creators to create their work and they're incentivized. And you also allow for a regime where users can use those works under um, circumstances that are beneficial for everybody, right? So you have that bill. Linked to that, you have the Performers Protection Amendment Bill, which deals with primarily performers um, and how they interact in that space. And unfortunately for the two, they've been linked. Yes. And they are cross-references between one and the other in each of the bills. So if you pass one, you have to pass the other. But can't they be delinked? We propose that to the legislators. And what did they say? Uh, they give us the middle finger. <laughs> so why? It takes too much time. No, they, they didn't even consider it. They didn't even consider it. Sure. They didn't this even is, who are these people? I wanna, <laughs> like, who are these people? Because, you, you know, I guess maybe for the normal layman, they don't understand that it, it affects the rands and cents and the livelihood of my, you know, these colleagues, some of the people that you grew up seeing yeah. as giants. Yeah. And when you look at the shoe he's wearing, it when you is. think of the fact that he's living in a room, a back room, and in this television, the telenovela, he's playing a boss of yes. an empire. Yes. But the poor man is, he's, 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 he's living in dire poverty. Yeah. You know, people don't understand that dynamic and how crushing that is. And when you see creative, you know, you know stick into this cycle of substance abuse, people think, oh, they just spoiled. No, it's a hard life. It's I, a I, hard I couldn't life. Be, I'm lucky in the sense that I, I'm a lawyer. Yeah. I am in the creative industries, but I am a lawyer. <laughs> 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 so I, I can ply my craft in that way. Whereas yes, people who... Th their souls oh, are about creation. There's and nothing it's a else. Calling. Yeah, it's a calling. There's it's nothing else calling. they can do. And you're not able to um, put food on the table. Mm. You're not able to send your kids to school. Mm. You're not able to buy a house. You're not able to have a steady oh, income. Man. You know, it, it's, I, I, oh, have, I don't know how they But the whole world live. reveres you. Correct. But, you know, you can't even afford to live up to that reverence. Correct. Oh. Correct. And, and just, you know, the psychological, I don't know how, I don't know mm. how, how they do it. Yeah. And, 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 and I must say from the outset, they have to be compensated. Yeah. They must earn their royalties. But what they've been sold is a dream. Mm. Because you must understand that creators of works do exactly that. Performers of works perform the works that have been created by the creators. If you kill the creation, there will be nothing for you to perform. And some performers are creators as well. So you find, for instance, songwriters are also performers of their work, so they can earn on either end. But if you're not incentivized to create or write a song and then that, there's nothing to perform, then there's nothing. Yeah. So yes, you pass the law and they'll tell you you get 100% royalties or whatever the, the percentage is, but it will be 100% of zero because there'll be no creations to perform. And in, 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 sorry, in, in the instance of, of the craft of filmmaking and television, mm. it's even worse. Yeah. Because most of the time, like 98% of the time, the writer and the performer are not the same person. Correct. So that's just... Yeah. No script, no performance. Well, I mean, they've got AI, you know. But you <laughs> I mean, I'm just saying... <laughs> Funny, uh, let me tell you, funny, this past week, so, you know, there's, a, there's a, quite a close friend who's in, um, you know, the, um, the tech space. Yeah. And we've been kind of dabbling and trying to make research around what is this AI. Yes. And, you know, we just put it in there. We asked AI to write a script. We gave it, you know, prompts. We said a, ro a rom-com. That thing is proficient. That thing makes things happen, but it does have its glitches. It has know? its glitches. It, you, you, the creativity is not there. Yeah. It just goes, and you type something in, and it goes and just delves into the, the, the web and then comes and says, yes, it will spit out something proficiently yeah. for you. It's not a problem. But is it that great script for that great movie that can earn those great awards? I mm. don't know. I don't think so. I don't think you can, you can replace that with artificial intelligence. It will churn out a lot of stuff. No one is lying. Churn out stuff, probably that's not even, uh, I don't think it's that good. Um, and, and in the creative space, maybe that's different. In, uh, for, for instance, for us in the legal space, uh, there's even been recent case law where it, it makes up <laughs> cases. It makes up? <laughs> makes up case law. It doesn't exist. 
Ah. So, you know, when you argue a case, you yeah. need to rely on case law as precedent yes. to, to make your argument. Makes up case law. Lawyers go to court arguing on the basis of case law that doesn't exist. Sure. You know, you get, you get in trouble for that. Someone yeah. has got in trouble for that. So there, there, there those issues with, with AI, it might not be as bad in some industries as others, but I, I don't think you can ever truly replace that creativity that comes from a human being. The raw emotion that goes into no. writing a song, the raw emotion that goes into writing a great script, no. a machine will try and replicate it, mm. but it can never do it. That's my view anyways. This is insane, man. It's very intense. I mean, with... You know, it, it, it just boggles my mind that these people are unable to untie these two bills, which, you know, speak to two different, you know, you know uh, uh, things. So what's the next step if one able to unbundle the performance bill and the copyright bill? Can I tell you this government of yours, this, oh. this parliamentarians of yours, oh. last week, Thursday, yeah. they passed the bills in the National Assembly. And where we're sitting now, they're off, if they're not already on his desk, to the president to either A, sign them into law, B, do nothing, C, refer the bills to the constitutional court because they are unconstitutional provisions um, in both the bills. But now I thought, okay, I thought, right, all the other political parties, the political, um, what do you call them, political, not the main one, Rivals, political... The opposition parties. Opposition, yeah. sorry, my yeah. <laughs> The political oppositions have been voting against this bill. They have. Right? So if everyone is a voting against this bill, how come the ruling party still has, you know, they're, they're able to pass this? Or it's because they have majority in parliament? They have majority in parliament and they have a mandate. So they vote on a slate. So if the ANC's position is a yes, the ANC's position is a yes. There's no room for... And it's the same with all the other political parties. There's yeah. no room for dissent. You vote as a block. Mm. So if they can sign this thing in, what happens post elections? We get a new, no, let's say we get a new political dispensation. So if the president signs it into law, it will be law. So it's, it's moot whether there's a new political dispensation because it will be signed into law. What then happens is that we, the lawyers, now start fighting about this thing, which oh. will take a long time. And still the uncertainty will remain. Okay, so here's the question. How much time do we have and what can we do on the ground to make sure that this bill is extensively looked in, into and uh, is not passed like the Europeans were able to do? So, look, what we're doing as a coalition is that we obviously have been fighting for years. Um, we've been making submissions to Parliament. We have been writing to uh, the decision makers, the policy makers. We've been lobbying. We've been throwing marketing at it, everything we could do. And I think if you look over the last uh, two or so weeks, we have been running an intensive campaign about this. Fine. They passed it last week. It's okay. <laughs> it's, still, it's still a fight. Um, we are still continuing to lobby. We are still continuing to educate uh, advocate as much as we can. We currently have a campaign, I mean, a petition that's running online. You can go to our website, copyrightcoalitionsa.org, uh, and sign the petition. Uh, we have that running. You can um, look at the information on our website about this um, because it's there. There's also information there about what, what is a fact and what is a myth. Because like you're saying, there's a lot of that. Nobody knows what's what. Uh, we, we demystify that for you. And what works with, because it's now elections, is that I think people must now start making TikToks videos about this thing and make them go viral. <laughs> That's the only thing that they listen to, really. They need to be in a position where they understand that this is not going to be what's good for the creative industries. It's going to decimate the creative industries and they need to see that it's coming from the ground. Uh, because I think a large part of the problem is that us lawyers in our suits you know, always doing all the yeah. talking, technicalities, big words, yeah. etc. They need to understand that the industry is against, um, and I'll say bills loosely because they're interlinked, uh, because there are a lot of people within industry who are still saying pass the performance protection amendment bill, but there are technicalities around that because it's so far gone yeah. um, and, and not pass the, the, the copyright amendment bill. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, the, and, and, and maybe the challenge in terms of rallying the masses is you know the legal jargon is 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 quite a high, high level. Mm. So by the time you hear it, when you're outside of you, you you're like, whoa, I'm so dizzy. <laughs> yeah. What are we talking about? I just want to get paid. So yes, I think we need more content creators. 
mm-hmm. to create awareness. Mm-hmm. And maybe, you know, it's on the part of maybe the organization to find ways of speaking to, to content creators and educating them. Yeah. And maybe some kind of incentivization or volunteer program to say, guys, use your platforms, yeah. you know, to let people know what is going on. Yeah. Uh, lastly, how much time do we have until, you know, this this bill gets passed? Do we have more? I mean, until everything is kind of signed or what's basically done and dusted? So we've now focused our attention to the president because mm. it's now rest with him um, to decide. But the president has got about 74 odd bills that he must consider between now and May, end of May. And with each one of those bills, there are certain things that he needs to take into consideration. Does it meet constitutional master? And depending on the circumstances, other factors that he needs to look into. So we are focusing our attention on him to say, do not sign the bills into law, because that would be disastrous. And then he must look into the options that he has if he doesn't sign the bills, because that would be devastating. Uh, for for the creative industries. So we have a very short, what what are we now in March? (laughs) Uh, We're in mid-March already, basically. Mm. Um, We've got April. And then May. And a little bit of May. But do you think he's going to sign all 74 of them or? It depends um, on each bill. So if it's reached this stage, for instance, with ours, he can only look at the constitutional issues. And if he and, and his advisor as such believes that they are constitutional issues that uh, have not been addressed. And even with this bill, <laughs> it's been going on for so long. He's already referred it once back to parliament to deal with the constitutional issues that we and other stakeholders raised at the time. And He's, were they amended? No. <laughs> so most probably it's going to come back. So he will have to then refer it to the constitutional court. And so, what what role, what role with this uh, with this um, um, what do you call the survey? Not survey. Uh, petition. Petition. Yeah. Uh, do. So then that shows that there is a significant number of the populace that are against this bill. Okay. We can show that there is a significant number of the populace. People have signed on and said, "I disagree with this thing." Okay. So that's one of the tools that we can use. We will continue in the background to try and explain the legal issues. Um, try and explain what options they are in terms of moving forward. But we really need this thing to come from the ground where people are saying, no, hmm. not on our watch. So you hear, guys, uh, go to www. Copy- Copyright Coalition SA. <laughs> Copyright Coalition SA. You will see it here. All right. Copyright Coalition SA. Dot org. Dot org. And make sure that you add your signature and your name to this petition to make sure you know to 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 make sure that we are we are protected as creatives and the future generations actually have an industry to inherit fantastic thanks so much now we're going to go to um a bit more of uh the lighter side of our show so our next segment is called either or basically i give you um some statements Uh uh-huh with two options per Uh statement (laughs) And uh, you choose one that you prefer, most of the other. Get it? Okay. Cool. And I I, I know, like, your daughter wants to go into filmmaking. Yeah. And you're a lover of film and television. Um, So I think you'll do well with this one. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, let's see. Let's go. A modern setting or a historical setting? Historical. Oh, okay. Okay, Give give me examples of of uh, films that, you know, have a bit of a historical setting. That you... So I love the the period pieces. Yeah. I even love that literature. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. And notwithstanding all the horrible things around race and yeah. <laughs> class and... <laughs> but the whole aesthetic of it all, right? Yes, yes. Yeah. I remember as a kid, I used to love, like, cowboy, you know, kind of, you know, yeah. setups and stuff. So yeah. I, I completely agree. Yeah. Okay. Dialogue heavy of visual storytelling depends but visual yeah 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 i find sometimes words can be a bit like Ooh, yeah, yeah, yeah you we have, heard you and you have to be invested yeah it's true <laughs> and concentrated and you know that, that's why theater is not for everyone eh? yeah sometimes people yes it's, they, you know those writers the right you know monologue after monologue after yeah. yeah yeah so yeah no i get you realism or fantasy fantasy Uh-oh. there's too much realism in my life <laughs> too much you want to escape right yes <laughs> okay comedy or thriller 
thriller. Oh, interesting. Interesting. <laughs> interesting. Okay, hand drawn animation uh -huh. or CGI? Hmm. That's a tough one. Well, wait, let, me, let me make it easy for you. Yeah. The Lion King, the first one or the latest one? Ah, uh, the first one. Ne? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you can just feel, I went, uh, I, I, I went with my son to go watch the new one. And I was like so disappointed. Like, oh, these kids don't really get, you know, like yeah. there's certain expressions. Yes. I, can't, I just can't yeah. wait to be king. Yeah. You know, yeah. that was lovely. Yeah. Okay. Uh, blockbuster or an independent film? Uh, blockbuster. Oh, you love those? Hey, sometimes independent films, I know. Like I said, you yeah. need to. I need to. Yeah, you <laughs> they're <know>. too real. <laughs> <laughs> Remember Trevor Noah was like, you know, Oscar winning films are like the vegetables of film. You know, like yeah, the stuff you don't really want to eat. Like, oh, damn it. <laughs> but they're critically acclaimed. <laughs> yeah, exactly, right? Where the blockbusters are like a nice burger, it's partial. Things blow up. You know what I'm saying? A sauce, that's all. That's what it is, yeah. So um, here's a question. In an ideal world, mm -hmm. what bills would you like passed for South African creatives to help ease their journeys? I think we do need, definitely need uh, copyright legislation. That's critical, but fit for purpose. That makes sense, right? That will grow the industry. Uh, same thing with uh, for the performers. And, and not just bills because Part of the challenge with these bills is that they're trying to fix things that are industry-related problems that industry should fix, or policy issues that policy should fix, you know, or just maybe contractual things that people, but obviously that requires education. So there's an education problem, there's an awareness problem, there's an ability to conduct yourself in the creative industries problem that won't be fixed by legislation. They need to think broadly about what is the problem and how do we fix it? And it's not just a legislature's role. Stakeholders in the industries also need to come to the party and fix things. There needs to be an acknowledgement of the wrongdoing um, by certain stakeholders to other stakeholders so that we can move forward um, in a lot of instances. All-time favorite film? Ah. Uh, <laughs> come you know, on. You know, I'm thinking about this thing. I'm thinking of Barbie because my daughter... <laughs> Bobby, oh Lord, help <laughs> what, us. What, no. what, 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 it's, not, it's not, I've gone completely blank. I've gone completely okay. blank. Okay, it we'll just came you. to mind because Barbie. she was making us vote the other day. Oh, okay. It's okay, we'll keep it there. <laughs> Guys, uh, Shola's uh, all-time favorite film of all time is Bobby. Okay. The themes, the feminism. Theme. Okay. It's a silly one, but... <laughs> okay, I never had the privilege of watching it, I should. I just... I just it isn't, but I've I, won. I saw all that pink. <laughs> all that, I was like, this is not me. I went to Oppenheimer. You know, I just wanted to. She's also watched that. <laughs> I'm sure she hated it. No, she loved it. Oh, okay. How old is she? She's 15. Okay. No, she's at that point in her life where she can consume different kind of topics. Yeah. That's wonderful. Yeah. That's wonderful. Shola, thank you so much for joining us. This conversation that we've had is so important. Yeah. You know, um... And it speaks so much to the future of where we're going. I mean, everyone is so excited about the future and we'd hate to see it all crash in front of our eyes. Yeah. So if there's any final words you'd like to say to our viewers uh, in terms of, you know, I mean, we, now we're going into um, <clears throat> the voting season, um, any kind of advice and in any way that we should like to urge them, uh, please do. Make informed decisions. Um, every political party has a manifesto. Everybody is making you promises um, which they might or might not be able to keep after they get that vote of yours. Remember that once they have that vote, um, they'll only see you in the next five years, right? And in between that time, whether or not they keep their promises really <laughs> is, is you know, up in the air. So read those manifestos. Um, critically look at what they're promising. Is it feasible? Is it not feasible? Does it make sense for your life, for your family's life, for the country? Um, and make your decision based on that. Thank you so much. 
Hi everyone, welcome to Reviews with the Film Biz Show. My name is Julia Kamanga and I will be your host. Reviews focuses on me and my guests watching a movie or TV show, mostly local, sometimes international, and we're going to be talking about how we really feel about the movie.